do you see that women are separating men into the alphas that they want to have sex with and the betas that they just simply want to have relationships with? Carl, I know you got this one. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things I noticed is uh, Krauser, I read an article of him years ago. For those of you who are not familiar, he runs a site called Krauser Day Game. It's one of the best day game sites, if not the best on the internet. And he was... Um, I totally agree. I, Krauser's this, a good friend, too. But he was writing out this uh, approach that he did with a girl on how he kind of goes out and he tries to see if she's R or K selected, meaning does she want to fuck right now or does she want a relationship? And he has um, DHV stories. For those of you who are watching or not familiar with it, it's a display of higher value. It's a story you tell a woman to make yourself look good. Mm -hmm. And he has them for the R selected girl. He has one where he had a threesome with a porn star while doing coke in Prague. <laughs> and then he has his uh, K selected one, which is uh, about him being a judo coach for his nephew. And I think it's kind of the same thing with uh, the sexual marketplace now that you have to screen for girls who are into you, but you can only figure that out with directness and being very over the top very early. Like I, I've even noticed it, especially with the, like when you start chatting with girls on Tinder, if, you, if the chat goes longer than two to three days and you don't meet up, you're going to be in that beta category. Right. And it's just, I think it's because it's become so convenient for women to screen that way. Mm -hmm. And then they get a little bit of extra information. And if you, if you haven't made a really bold move really early on, you're just going to be put in that beta category because they know the alpha guy would have made the move already. Right. right. And it makes you know, sense if you think about it. If you got three days, you can't escalate for three fucking days. Mm hmm so all you're really doing is telling her all the mysteries about you that uh, gives her tingles. So you're basically just stepping on well, stepping on your own toes. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to say is uh, Alan Roger Curry uh, is very mm. big on the straight up, you know, direct game. And I mean, like really direct game where it's like basically you on the first date or certainly within the first, you know, uh, first couple of times of meeting with a woman that you're very upfront and very specific about sex saying look i find you attractive uh i'd really like to have sex with you blah 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 okay and just put I, it on that put it on the table and go go for it okay loved his spiel on that by the way at 21 last year yeah yeah and, and i think that there's a lot of positive things about that i think there's some some negative things particularly in the me too era <laughs> but um i i understand the need for that kind of pragmatism where you have to sort of just you know get down to brass tacks with women and say, look, am I, I mean, am I the, the, am I the alpha guy that you want to have sex with? Or am I the beta guy that you, that you want to think that you want to have some sort of relationship with? Because I'm not willing to be that guy. I'm the alpha dude. And I want your genuine desire. And I want you to, I mean, that this, I'm not saying say it in these words. Okay. I'm just saying that the, the gist or the drive of the conversation has to be to determine where you fit in on that spectrum. Am I on the alpha spectrum or on the beta spectrum? And I think that mode one, what he calls mode one, which is very, very direct game, sort of separates the men from the boys, I guess, in that, in that respect. So uh, if the woman is into you, she's going to respect your directness. She's going to say, well, at least he, he's, he knows what he wants and he's, he's driving for it. Uh, Mike, the guy that I, I work with, he, uh, he is he's very direct. He's very impulsive. And so like, I'm trying to help him in those terms saying, look, if that's the case and that's what you want to do, and you think you're, you're, you're all about impulsivity, uh, that's good. But we have to temper that with some humor. We have to temper that with some, some good natured feelings. But if you're going to be, um, if you're going to be, uh, that direct, then you've got to sweeten it up a little bit and say, you know, hey, I'm, this is just how I am. And if, if, that, if that's not what you're into, hey, you know, thank you very much, shake hands, no, no harm, no foul kind of thing. Uh, I, I think that a lot of guys, particularly blue pill guys, guys who are still plugged in, tend to think that they, they, they're playing the long game. They think that, oh, if I just do what I got to, if I could just, you know, if I can be her friend and if I can establish rapport, and, and this is the one area 
of like pickup artistry game that I kind of separate myself from because people like mystery method and a lot of this stuff with, with pickup artists, they, they want to say, well, you need to establish comfort and you need to establish rapport. Uh, I'm of the opinion that while that might be important after the lay, it's not as important before the lay. I think more, uh, I think more in terms of anxiety and urgency and sexual tension need to be needs to be your priority when you're doing like when you're sarging or when you're you know when you're in the early stages of dating those are uh that that is what women really get off on they that uncertainty that am i going to get with this guy and this guy's high value uh what's going to happen that that roller coaster ride um I've, I've explained this on several different posts of my own where it's like women are looking for that that danger they're looking for that uncertainty that unpredictability that spontaneousness and they want it with a guy who's good looking and they want it with a guy who just gets it and who can play the game with them rather than explaining the game and that's the one part of like say mode one that i'm a little i'm a little off on simply because when you do that you are explaining the game you're you're pulling the veneer off of this and you're not you, you say hey you're playing a game and i'm playing a game so let's just talk about this game and what happens then is you get into what's called the observer effect. And what that means is observing a process will change that process. So if I start talking about how I'm gaming a, a woman or how I'm relating to a woman, then she understands and she changes her behavior because now we have everything's above board and we're just talking about, you know, I've always said that women want to play the game and they, they don't want to be told that they are playing the game. And that's part of the just get it kind of dynamic right there. Um, so uh, I think that in an age of open hypergamy where women are above board with that, you kind of have to embrace some aspect of the observer effect, like what I was just talking about. Yeah. When women and when I mean, you can see this. I mean, if you have a red pill lens and you look at you know, commercials, if you look at a lot of popular music today, if you look at uh, movies and media and things like that, uh, you will see open hypergamy in so many different variations and so many different iterations right now that it's it's almost impossible to not see it now. Uh, and so when you're red pill aware, you can't help but have that observer effect, but say, okay, I see what she's doing. That guy's the alpha, that guy's the beta. This is the beta who's trying to get in there and she doesn't want him. She wants to get with the other guy. Um, one other thing, that, uh, aspect of this that I wanted to talk about too, is I have a post called Plan B. And I wrote that because it was a study, there's, some, there's actually a few studies, a few researches um, about how women will establish a primary lover and then they will have their plan b they'll have the guy who's the plan b guy in case things don't go out or don't go well with that other guy uh, i think women do this uh, sort of naturally i mean instinctually uh, because they're hedging their bets they want to have a safe place to fall if things don't work out with the alpha guy they want to have that that you know comforting beta who's going to be right there to to say it's okay don't worry about it you know and then she, that's when she's going to convince herself and say oh he was the right guy all along, you know, and I think it was it. I think it's like 40 some odd percent of women have a, an established plan B guy. And even the plan B guy knows that he's the plan B guy and he still s goes along with that. And again, this goes back to the separation between women make rules for betas and they break rules for alphas. So um, that's that's one of the things that I kind of wanted to talk about. Um, the other aspects I think of, um, of where we're at in peak hypergamy is where, again, I think women are it's kind of openly embracing this, but they can't openly express that they are. Um, like I said, it was when I was watching these, these videos of these women who were talking about, um, you know, the, the reasons why they can't find a good man, I think that they're still kind of lying to themselves. They're still kind of trying to convince themselves and work off of these social conventions that tell them that they can still have it all and they can still have that guy. They can still have that, you know, they're, they're entitled. I should say they're entitled to the guy who has his shit together 
Um, Donovan and I have talked about this in the black community where uh, black women tend to have these very grossly over overinflated ideas of what it is that they deserve in life. They deserve that that one guy who is, you know, athletic and good looking and alpha, but also has a shit together, would make a good father, but yet they don't see the exchange. They don't see what they have to bring to the table. And I've also talked about this as well is that women completely ignore value added. They, they don't understand that the reason that they are seen as sexual commodities today is because they've made themselves completely worthless beyond the sexual. So women complain about being objectified and they complain about sexual object. You know, I, I don't want to be a sexual object for you. Okay. I understand that. But what else do you bring? What other value do you have besides your body, besides your sexuality, besides how you look and how good you have sex with a guy? Uh, what else do you bring to the table? And women will, will fight me on this <laughs> constantly. They won't answer it. <laughs> yeah, they won't answer that because they don't feel that they should have to do that. They feel that they are entitled to a guy who brings everything to the table. And you they, know the weirdest thing, too? Mm -hmm. Like, just being able to cook. That'd be the perfect answer. Oh, I can cook. Not one. I've never had... Actually, Kat, or the one I'm with now, she's the only one who's ever said that. Mm -hmm. She could cook as that qualifier. Right. So she's been here for 10 years. Just throwing that out there, ladies. Well, well, I mean, when, when you talk about, when you've got guys who are, they have to jump through these hoops and they have to, you know, follow all these rules, but yet there's no reward for that. There's no, there's no benefit for them for having to, to, to do all of that stuff. Well, there's a lot of things to jump on and unpack here, but if we, the whole thing with directness in the age of Me Too, the interesting thing is at the same time as you have the Me Too campaign, you get women who you have to be direct with. So mm -hmm. it's kind of the catch-22 that to be perceived as that alpha guy, you have to be direct. But that comes with the risk of getting hit with um, a Me Too complaint. But I, I also tend to think that Me Too is kind of overblown somewhat in our community because if you're hitting on girls you work with or women who are, let's say, tangential to your workplace, like... Uh, people who work for sister companies or people you buy shit from or your clients, et cetera, then yeah, you have a valid complaint because there is a kind of a power dynamic there. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the New York times are not going to run a story on how some guy was a bit too direct with the chick he met at the bar because mm -hmm. it's kind of expected. And it's the same thing with, you know, worst thing that happens if you do something above a little bit aggressive on something like Tinder or something is that there's going to be a screenshot with your name out there. And who really cares about that? That's not really that important. Mm -hmm. So I think it's most of the guys who are scared shitless of me too, are not the guys who would be in trouble. The guys who are going to be in trouble are the guys who are constantly sticking their pen in the company ink. Mm -hmm. And I also think if you frame the whole interplay as a negotiation between two parties the guy wants to get laid the woman wants to get laid and they're really just discussing the price points mm -hmm. is this a, a guy for whom the woman will is willing to do anything to get the deal done or is this a guy for that has to sweeten the deal for her in order to get her to go and i think mode two as alan roger curry says it it's being more of the traditional gentlemanly type guy, that means you're kind of obscuring what you're negotiating. It's mm -hmm. uh, one of those meetings you're sitting in where everyone is discussing and everyone's talking, but no one's addressing the elephant in the room. And I think what happens with a lot of these guys is they completely hide their dick. They never show any form of interest that you wouldn't do for a friend or a family member. So it's the same conversation, except the guy is trying, he wants to sleep with the woman, but he just never wants to escalate the situation because there's this chance of rejection. Yeah, I think a lot of that goes back to the beta game is based on rapport. It's based on being her friend before being her lover. Um, it's, it's all of these, it's based on these feelings like that are, <laughs> that are really based on oxytocin when you think about it. They're based on comfort. 
Uh, they, they believe in the lie that when women say, I need to be comfortable with you before I have sex. No, women need to feel urgency. They need to feel anxiety. They need to feel that sexual, that's why we call it sexual tension. Cause that's exciting. That's what makes that's, you know, it's that uncertainty whether or not they're going to actually have sex with this guy who they consider alpha. What I see most beta guys do is they're uncomfortable with that they're uncomfortable with that urgency because they've never been good at it you know they've never been wanted for just being themselves they've never been wanted for being uh alpha in their entire lives they've never known any any kind of real genuine desire and so they get uncomfortable with that because it's it behooves them to believe that to get into a woman's pants or to get into a woman's heart is to make her feel comfortable and make and be the perfect boyfriend. We hear that all the time. Guys like I would be her perfect boyfriend. I don't understand why she's going out with all of these assholes because uh, you know, she's, she's just, you know, having sex with them. And then she comes to me and she cries to me and I'm her emotional tampon. Um, when a guy is in that mode and that, that way of thinking, he just doesn't understand the difference between alpha, alpha fucks and beta bucks. And I think that, that guy needs to understand that the way what he's basing his quote unquote game on is comfort and thinking that that's going to in some way ingratiate him into her intimacy. A problem with that is that that comfort breeds familiarity and familiarity, comfort, rapport, all of that is very anti seductive. And so this guy goes from being this very comforting, almost stuffed animal that this woman can hug and love on and cry on and everything else. And then when that guy finally thinks he's going to get in there and he's going to say, okay, now's, a, now's my chance. I'm going to be sexual with her. And now suddenly that stuffed animal has a heart on. She goes, Oh my God. You know, I can't believe you. You would think that I can't believe we're, we're friends. You're just like my brother. You're just like my dad. You're just like somebody that I can hug on and, and love on. You're not, they're not seeing you as that, that validational sex that, that as, it, as being something that's a viable sex partner, they're seeing you as a comfort partner as opposed to a sex partner. And he showed her that every step of the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's why the, you, you become a stuffed animal to her. And then when that stuffed yeah. animal becomes se has a sexual nature, it shocks her and she doesn't want to have anything to do with you. And that's, that's I think, is where women will say, uh, I, I can't believe nice guys. Nice guys just want to get in your pants. They just want to play this game where they can, you know, they can, uh, you know, pretend that they're nice and just so that they can get in there and find. And it's like they're they're suddenly shocked that this guy actually has a sexual nature. Here's a news flash for you, women. Men are all sexual. We all want to get with you. We all want to have sex with with women. Your heterose healthy heterosexual guy with high T levels. He wants to have sex with you. Okay, that guy who wants to be comfort with you and be your friend and all that stuff. You know what? Eventually, that guy is going to want to have sex with you, and so don't act surprised when that happens. Okay, you don't. Want say, the you want to be the um, you want to be the vibrator in her uh, <laughs> nightstand. You don't want to be the stuffed teddy bear on her bed. Uh, again, they, and then th that goes back to what Anthony was saying: that women see some guys as alpha and some guys as beta. And if you're if she's already dictating the terms of your relationship. And saying i need commitment before we have sex i need this before we have sex and she's already giving you hoops to jump through she sees you as the beta that's yeah. all that's that's all you need to all you need to understand is that some guys even that. sabotage that too rollo afterwards mm -hmm. i remember at the last year's 21 convention we were sitting down and uh i think hunter and i were showing a bunch of guys how to run some night game mm -hmm. it was 2008 again felt really cool and this one chick i was sitting there talking to her she looked like the stark one off of game of thrones mm -hmm. and it was the funniest thing uh Anthony's guy that works for him there, the guy with the mustache. Yeah. That actually was the story that got him out there and started approaching, which was awesome. But uh, I, she was asking, we were talking about and instantly made it sexual. Like, tell me your most awkward sex story. And she brought it up. And this is the guy who was in that alpha category for that night. She goes, yeah, he went to put on his condom and he turned his back to me when he put it on. And that was like her most like awkward sex story. So I don't, even some guys who can somehow slip one past the goalie still seem to screw it up there for a bit. <laughs> like she's going to have sex with you at that point. It's like your dick is there. You might as well just plop it right down, mushroom stamper on the forehead, put it on. And I just don't get why guys are embarrassed or insecure about this stuff. Like uh, Carl's probably got stats on this one. Girls have horrible spatial logic when you do like IQ tests and stuff like that. So they don't know the difference between five inches and seven. 
right now it's the biggest dick in the room and that should be good enough and i don't think that <laughs> lack of there's this lack of confidence and it's so weird because it's not even from the girl signaling back it's totally internal and it's i just don't know how to like when you say that i know guys are hearing that be the beta be the alpha she puts you in one category or the other but i don't think they truly believe they belong in it like an imposter syndrome instead of just assume you are until she tells you otherwise and more often than not unless you're completely incompetent nobody's going to tell you otherwise <laughs> well i think that's kind of funny with imposter syndrome because you get that a lot with uh, when you do corporate coaching you get told you know you have to believe that you belong in the room and i think with a lot of the beta guys a lot of them don't know that there's a that there are that you can sleep with a girl on the first night Mm -hmm. They think yeah. that old guys go through those uh, three, four, or eight dates before they get laid. But secondly, I think a lot of them are just, when they're put on the spot, they will take the least risky option every time. Mm -hmm. And they will kind of dodge themselves out of the interaction instead of going with their gut. Because I think, ultimately, I think alpha is a lot about id over uh, superego. And I think oh, beta is a lot about sure. super ego over it. So a lot of the guys who struggle with game are the guys who are very kind of rule bound, very good guys. They're kind of the southern old style southern gentleman or gentle dork, as Tanner would put it. And they're just trying to follow an old script that's no longer valid in the days where you know you have Tinder that's more or less like Amazon.com for cock. Oh, and Rolo, you have, when you coach guys, when people talk about this risk, have you ever asked them to articulate what they mean by that? Um, what do you mean by risk, though? I mean, well, you know, Carl's saying guys take the least risky option. I've done this with a bunch of married guys who are afraid of pissing off their wife because she'll continue to turn off the sex tap. Mm -hmm. And you're always like, so what? Do you, what's the worst case scenario? What's this risk you're worried about? And mm -hmm. it's point and sputter. Like guys can't even articulate what it is, what risk they're worried about hitting. I think married guys are afraid of experimentation. Um, most married guys, especially, the, you know, um, let's just be honest, 80% of guys are betas, okay? So let's yeah. just say 80% of, ma of married guys are not going to be setting the frame with their wives. And so they're afraid of, uh, of, of risking things. They're afraid of the risk of experimentation. So they don't want to rock the boat because they're yeah, just- Yeah, they don't want to rock the boat, but yeah. like, I'm afraid- I, I'm, I'm risky around bears because bears will eat me. Like that will, risk me. Exactly. well, it's like, oh, hey, I'm I'm only getting laid twice a month, so I don't want to risk that great gig, man. You know, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want, I want to upset her because if I do, then she'll hold out on me. Yeah, this and, job at McDonald's is sweet, yeah. man. I can, I might get you know, fry manager next month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, most guys, I mean, most guys, they, they carry over that beta game into their marriages. And so it's always in a woman's frame. They're always supplicating. They're always qualifying. I mean, we were just, what were we just talking about? We're talking about how men have to qualify for, you know, beta men have to qualify for a woman, whereas a woman will freely give away her sexuality to a guy that's, that is more alpha. And I think that that's one of the shocking things for beta men. I'm sure people in the, in the chat can, will probably attest to this is that, a lot of guys, when they get married, they, they get used to this understanding or they believe this lie that they have mismatched libidos or something with their wives. And they can't believe that their wives are actually having these, you know, getting wild with this alpha dude that and having the kind of sex that she never would have had with him. Or, you know, she never gave blowjobs or she never took it in, you know, she was never into anal. She was never, you know, any any of the stuff that like he always wanted to get, but he was too scared to to ask for, you know, and even just asking, you know, you, you don't ask, you just, you initiate, you go for it, you know, I mean, he's too yeah. scared to do that, to, to experiment with that. And then when he finds that he's divorced and he sees that his wife is out there and she just went to the gym for six months and she got herself into better shape and maybe she's with some guy who's, the, you know, the kind of guy that is like the opposite, the polar opposite of him. You know, she he doesn't understand how she could possibly turn into somebody that she was never, you know, the kind of person she never was when she was with him. And he was just the first guy that asked that's for like, it, essentially. That's, exactly. Well, it, it, that's because these guys don't understand the difference between validational and transactional sex. She was with you in a marriage because it was transactional, not because it was validational, not because she wanted to, have, wanted to be having sex with you. I mean, uh, it, outside of the very rare occasions where a guy is alpha and he can still, you know, handle his shit with his wife. 
Um, I, I tend to think that guys who are more red pill, who understand, you know, intersexual dynamics and they understand the female psyche, they tend to be better husbands, obviously, um, because they play the game rather than talk about the game. I think uh, one of the biggest disservices that we do to uh, married men today is to convince them that it's all about open communication in a healthy relationship. Ugh. Bullshit. It is about polarity. And the more polarity that you can have in your relationship and you can maintain your own identity and she maintains her identity and you've got that, that push and pull inside of a marriage. I mean, a lot of the stuff that, you know, that qualifies as game or pick, even pickup artist technique still applies in inside of marriage. Push pull is one of those great ones. Uh, pushing the envelope, uh, being spontaneous, shaking things up with your wife. I mean, what's she going to do? Not have sex with you for another week? Well, if you weren't only getting it like once or twice a month anyways, is that really going to put you out that much? If you're already jerking off anyways, why not shake it up? Why not be somebody a little bit? Why not Why not experiment? If you're going to be awakened while married, you got nothing to lose by not, you know, experimenting. Because most guys, when I talk to them, like you were talking about this, like they don't want to, they don't want to take those risks, but... <laughs> You know, they can't even articulate what they that can, means. They can't, even, yeah, they can't even tell you what that risk would be because they're so they're so petrified that their wives might leave them because that's the best thing they got going for them. And they also sort of invest themselves moralistically into their into their relationships. And they think that they're doing the right thing. And they're putting up with 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 no sex. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Carl. No, they're also I think one thing that dawned on me that they're just deathly afraid of any form of tension. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not yeah. just like with women, conflict. it's in a lot of any form of thing that could cause a conflict, mm -hmm. they avoid. Yeah. It's uh, something similar. We had it on the uh, crazy women um, episodes we did, where their react, the woman's reaction um, to an event is so extreme that in the end, you end up having this enormous degree of self-control over every action. It's like, oh, am I breathing too loud, honey? Because you're just trying to avoid her going off. But these guys have that in any relationship they have. It's with their boss. They're scared of asking for a higher salary because that could make their boss not like them or make their boss likely uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Or with uh, their family members, they're scared of having boundaries, like don't show up at my house at 3 o'clock in the morning and expect me to cook you food or call me up at 2 a.m. and come and get you from the club, etc. They're just very, very, they have a very low tolerance for any form of tension, conflict, or directness. So instead, they're indirect, they do whatever they can to build down the tension instead of building it up. And they just never focus on what they want. They focus 100% on what the other person wants. Yeah. So the, the, the three things that make sure you're not your own mental point of origin. Yeah. I, I hate, I, you know, this is kind of one of those rude red pill truths, but I, I have found that for most guys, when they get into sort of this sexual stagnation or the sexual retirement with their wives or their girlfriends for that matter, um, one of the things, <laughs> and, and this is really a tra I, I mean, it's a tragic part, but it's just simply part of, of women's nature is that they get off on conflict. They get off on that anxiety. They get off on what I call indignation. Uh, and the reason that you know that is because when you look at like women's daytime television, it's all about inspiring indignation in women. It's oh. all about it's all about triggering that that yeah, chemical rush for forty minutes plus commercials. Yeah, exactly. That's why you get like when you get like uh, Tyra Banks has like these cheaters on, or she's got these. You know, uh, I mean, hell, I mean, even when Doctor Oz had Roosh on, it was like you know they wanted that rise. You know, he's saying that we're fat. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they they love what it, the 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 rule that I say is that in the absence of indignation, women will fabricate or create their own in indignation. Um, so don't deny them that uh, men, most men want to want to keep the peace. They want to say, you know what? I just want things smooth. I want I want a nice tightly run ship. I don't want any, any conflict. And so as a result, they tend to give up a lot of their frame. They hand over frame because of that, because they're afraid of that anxiety. They're afraid of that conflict. And as human beings, we tend to want to shy away from conflict anyways. Uh, and to, so for me to tell guys, particularly married guys, uh, you need to inspire conflict. You need to inspire that indignation in a woman. That's like completely counterintuitive to any conflict, man. Yeah, yeah. In initiating conflict is just com a completely foreign thought to them. 
But that's the roller coaster that women tend to want. And that's if you want to know why you're getting into sexual stagnation. I, I tell guys this. I say, you know what? The hottest sex that you will ever have with your wife will be right after you broke up with her. When you have that makeup sex, you know, all of this stuff where where you're having these date nights and we're going to keep it fresh and we're going to have, you know, we're going to inspire the romance and rekindle the fire kind of bullshit. And you take your kids over to your sister, her sister's house or mom's house. And you, you, you set up the nice romantic and you know, sprinkle rose petals over the fucking bed or some shit like that. Yeah. They love that, obligations like that. That, <laughs> that is obligated. Seriously. That's obligation. Sex is what that is. It's like, Oh, you went to all this trouble. I guess I better have sex with my husband, you know? Um, but the hotter sex that you're going to have is not the one where you you arrange date night with you know candlelit dinner and all that shit. It's going to be after you had this screaming fight. She ran out of the house and you stayed there, or you did. You guys split up and you went to your corners of the ring, and then when you came back and you made up and you had sex right after you had that makeup sex, that that inspired urgency, that inspired uh, anxiety, that inspired. Uh, uh, what you call it? It just ins it it inspires that indignation. Yeah. It inspires the feelings that prompt a woman to have a desired sex with that guy. I, I what was it. Uh, most, <laughs> most unexpected pregnancies happen after makeup sex. So sure. like when we're having sex, you know, when having sex after a makeup, it's like, they're not, they're just throwing caution to the wind because they're just like having this angry kind of makeup sex that they weren't having before. And, you know, beta guys think, oh, great, finally, she's come back around. And now I've, now I'm going to, you know, now the frame is finally back with me. And they don't realize that it's just for that makeup sex. And that finally, after a while, they'll get comfortable and you'll slide back into that same familiar, uh, that same familiar system.